thank you very much for having me here. It's great to visit back my old alma mater. Great to see Dave and all the students here. Uh, my talk today was actually designed for about 90 minutes. So I'm going to try to cram that into a 45 minute presentation. So some of the slides I will um, skip through uh, if I think it's, if, if, uh, if, if I need to do that. Uh, my topic today is, uh, I named it as designing with context. And in the little sublet, it says designing for the masses. So what I like about design in general is that design is not physics, which means that it really does not have an absolute definition. Uh, it's within the eyes of the beholder. So uh, what, what the, the reason why I say for the masses is you could design something very unique, very edgy. But because I work for a large corporation that normally caters to hundreds of thousands of people, uh, this is some of the perspective that I developed if you're interested in designing for the middle of the bell curve. Okay? So public sectors, services, uh, you know, transportation system, things like that. Um, as Dave introduced me, uh, I started out my career at Fanuc Robotics in Michigan, uh, and now I'm at Samsung. I, I spent five years here at Calf from 95 to 2000. This is, was my very first product that I ever created for uh, commercially. It's a painting robot. Um, it's actually called the reciprocator for just the side of the robot. And I was responsible for all the mechanical components inside. Uh, did the dynamic analysis and all that. And this was the first car that was painted using that machine. Uh, I thought about buying that and engraving it permanently and putting it in my house, but I, di I didn't do it because it was too ugly. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't buy it because it was too ugly. Uh, we had a good run in 2009. By 2009, I was at Samsung, but um, 2009 was the year which I really got into more of a uh, design executive, uh, executive design committee within Samsung with a, a, a hit product uh, that <coughs> Uh, that kind of uh, was put on um, magazine covers. We, we did receive lots of re uh, awards from uh, New York Times and Bloomberg and all that. Uh, since two and a half years ago, I've been working on home appliances specifically. Um, and some of the products that you see, maybe this is probably one of the interesting ones. Uh, I'll just talk about this and I'll move forward. Um, this, this will launch this year. And it was actually a context and insight gotten from the US, then applied to a European uh, washing machine. So in the US, right, <coughs> most of us uh, use a, a washing machine that's known as a top loading machine. You, you lift it up. If you have something that you forgot, you just you know, dump it in. No big deal. In Europe, because the space is very limited, it needs to go in underneath a cabinet or it has to fit in a specific DIN standards. Therefore, they have a washing machine that's very different looking. It's called front loader. And usually the front loader, because of the water level and everything, once you push the start button, everything locks in. So what happens if you forget a little sock or something, right? If I survey Korea as well as US, that pain point comes out very often. In Europe, it's almost like no pain point because it's one of those things that they don't know what they're missing. You know, they completely lose their mind, saying like, you know, like it's like it's almost like dealing with the government bureaucracy. Like, oh shit, I forgot my sock. There's nothing I can do. We have to we have to wait hour and a half for the next cycle. So it was a context and insight transferred over to Europe. No, actually, there's a better way of doing that. And we went through a lot of engineering efforts. I mean, it, was, it looked simple, but it was very difficult because you had to carve the, the glass inside and cutting the material cost down everything. But that value proposition was stuck into Europe. And it's kind of on its path of becoming one of the best sellers in Europe. Um, we're going to launch something really crazy, but I'll not talk about this. I'll move for, uh, So some thoughts uh, before I begin my argument. Um, let's say that someone gave you, you know, some flowers. And you want, it's, it's, you know, you want it to display at your, at your home nicely. 
let's say you are, this is your profile and this is your requirement, let's say that you wanted to accommodate just two or three, not a whole bouquet, just two or three flowers, long stem flowers. Uh, you want them to last for about a week. Uh, you want to kind of see most of the flowers, not just you know the, the leaves, but also the stem and everything. And let's say the person is a female professional, very busy professional homeowner, uh, known as Henry. Do you guys know the term Henry? High earning, not rich yet. That's kind of an industry <laughs> lingo, right? So you're a Henry. And you want to give this job to someone, right? I don't want just an ordinary vase. So you gave it to an artist. So what would an artist do? An artist got so much inspiration out of the word, he creates something like this. Beautiful, but functionally a crap, right? It doesn't hold a single drop of water. I mean, it's a beautiful piece of object. In fact, it looks like something that Gaudi would do, right? And it, it's, it's really beautiful. If I can find something like that, I'd probably buy it. But not, not, not as a vase, right? So, okay, so when the artist brought this to this uh, female professional, she was very disappointed because it was beautiful, but there's nothing she can do about it functioning as a vase. So then she commissions an engineer. What would an engineer do? Engineer says, I have a perfect solution for you. And he comes up with something like this, right? <laughs> Functionally perfect, like right? holds the water, cheap material cost, never breaks, right? Completely earth friendly. She doesn't want that in her house, right? It's so what would a designer would do? Designer would do something like this, right? That's both functional and emotional. So what I mean by that, the lesson here is in one end of the spectrum, there's the functional stuff. On the other end of the spectrum, there's emotional stuff. Engineering, for the most part, is a discipline trying to figure out how to functionally work. Art in general deals with human emotions. There is no reason why I need that painting on the wall. I just want it there, right? There's really no functional need. Design sits right in the middle. It has to balance both the functional and the emotional needs and wants. And I, in my very simple view of design, this is what design is all about. So before I, so how do you balance those two? Before I get into that conversation, let's, let's examine a little bit what went wrong with the, the, uh, the uh, engineer and the artist, right? Now, how many of you guys are familiar with um, this framework called Kolb Exper Experiential Learning Model? Can you raise your hands? Okay, one. All right, so I'll, 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 if, you, if there are a majority of people who knew that uh, framework, I was just going to skip it because I think it's a foundation for good design. But let me cover from that. So I said two opposite end, right? Um, let's, let's say we have a four by four or two by two. In one end, right, just as, just as you had the functional and the emotional, in, a one, in one end, there are concrete piece of evidences and you can, you can do a complete abstraction, right? You can fake yourself, it's not there, but you can fake yourself and you can pretend it's there, right? Um, in one end, there's analysis. On the other end, what is it? What's the opposite to analysis? Synthesis, right? So if you, if you put those two in, in, in X and Y framework, when you are about to launch an investigation, a design, anything in general, you start from the bottom left corner. There are concrete pieces of evidences and you analyze and you observe. And that's known as context. That's what you see, what you hear, those are facts. When you see those facts, then the next thing that you tend to do, you tend to put an extraction. You tend to put your own interpretation of what you saw based on your own knowledge, based on your own experience. That's called framework, right? What you think it is. You know, I saw a rock, but I think a rock means this, right? 
when you have an abstraction, then you start having an idea of what you want to do with that. And that's called imperatives. So at that point, it's not only abstract, you're trying to synthesize problem solving. So there's lots of ideas flowing, what, you know, what I want to do with all these things that I found. So at that stage, there's a lot of idea flowing in your mind. And that's the reason why, I say, why, I, you know, why people say there's no bad idea. There are bad concepts, but there, but there are no bad ideas because it's abstract and it's in the synthesis mode. Once you filter down through some validation, then you start <laughs> developing your solution, right? That should be, your solution has to be very concrete and it's usually a synthesis of all the, of the facts that you found. <laughs> so when you go one full circle from observation all the way down to solution, that's how you walk from obser observing to generating insights to, to having ideas and coming up with solutions. That's a full design circle, okay? And this model was developed by uh, a human psychologist. Um, his name's Cole, and it was uh, developed in the mid-70s. And I find this framework extremely helpful. I actually use this at work almost exclusively, and this is probably the only thing that I want to know to do my job better. Um, so if I put this into uh, a product development point of view, you know, the, 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 it's the data and the requirements that you first see and encounter. Then you do the interpretation. Then you explore different options, right? In the course of doing that, you get your idea, you validate. And uh, lastly, you make it real, right? And you go through one for circle. So what's wrong with uh, the artist? The known conditions were these, like two to three flowers, long stem, and it has to be a vase. And you know, the, the user wanted the flower to last at least about a week, right? So it had to have some water holding uh, capability. So, and then uh, she didn't explicitly say who she was, but some of the facts, like it was a female, busy professional, homeowner, etc. So on the top, you had the explicit data. On the bottom, you had the implicit data, right? And then at the end, you were going to create a vase. Um, those were the known conditions. So an artist had to walk from the data and strategize the approach, come up with some ideas, and maybe validate with the consumers, and then finally create her own uh, ob object, right? But what did she do wrong? She selectively took some of the explicit data to her own likings, completely bypassed strategizing and didn't even actually create any ideas. She went straight into the design and created her own uh, object. Something that she liked, but the users didn't, right? And functionally, it didn't really meet uh, the requirements. Uh, what did the engineer do? Engineers studied the requirement very carefully, the explicit data, and she, he strategized the approach somewhat. But he completely ignored the implicit data. He thought that the user was himself. You know, like, I don't care the aesthetics, you know, as long as it's a pants, it's a pants, you know? So, didn't really validate that and went to output. So, didn't walk the full circle. So, those two mistakes um, caused a very skewed, very biased design a completely functional design or a completely, well, a completely functional object or a completely emotional object. So a well-designed product or service is a result of balancing those two, um, balancing between emotional and functional needs and wants. But it's just not emotional and functional. There's actually more. Um, and when you do that, the context is also full, a uh, full data set. It's uh, explicit data and implicit data. Um, I said balancing functional and emotional needs and wants, right? But it's more than that. Um, it's actually hard requirements, tangible things, or tangible requirements, or very explicit requirements versus soft requirements, something that's intangible, and maybe something that's very implicit, right? So those are all the things that you need to balance as a designer. But more importantly, on top of all of these, 
there's one element that you have to balance very carefully, and that's between you and the user. You as a designer and the one that you are trying to uh, satisfy. Balancing that is actually harder than you think. I call this yin and yang in design. Um, the reason why I call this yin and yang in design is every single one of us, without any single exception, we are all biased based on our own context, based on our upbringings, our society, our education, our taste. We are all biased. Every single one of us um, is biased. So when we are biased, when we look at things, we might come up with one design, but it could completely offshoot to another design uh, if someone else sees it, right? And those gaps are missing or misinterpreted context, right? So when you say user-centric design, which is a very common term used in the creative community, uh, you hear a lot about user-centric design, user-centric design. In, in my definition, user-centric design is user and their context, plus how you see it based on your context. It needs to be normalized in order to be a true user-centric design. Biased design sometimes works for biased users um, that are biased to you. So if you look at high-end designers that create something very weird, they have their followings. I'm not saying biased design is wrong. They have their own uh, crowd. They have their own target segment. But if you're designing something for the masses, like public transit, services, products, um, it's very dangerous to have a biased point of view. So I'll give you, uh, I'll, 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 let me sidetrack you a little bit um, on this unbiased uh, users. Uh, when you look at us versus Apple, um, when, when we created uh, Samsung's Galaxy 6 phone, uh, we removed the battery not, um, and then we removed the uh, micro SD slot. And because of those two functional um, disappearances, many of our customers went to use Apple. So basically their argument was, now it's the same as Apple, you know. It's, there's no functional advantage. Why would I stick with something that looks not as good as Apple? So there was a, a user who was loyal to a functional needs. Uh, even those users, when those functions were taken away, they chose to be more on the emotional side. On the other hand, um, there's a lot of Apple users actually that came back to Galaxy. And their number one complaint, you know what, is interestingly the back button. So when they start out their experience with, an, with a Galaxy phone or Android phone, and when they move to the Apple phone, because Apple phone, because it's cool and it's very minimal design, it only has one home button, not having that back button create a lot of mess in the UI because you've got to move up and down and try to figure out how to go back. So most of our customers that comes, that's coming back to us, their number one complaint is it's lacking a core functionality, right? So someone who wanted to stay in the emotional side is coming back to us. So this is a good indication why a balanced design is generally good for the masses. If I were going to design, if I were to design, I'm actually going to design something like this. It needs a back and a forward button. OK, so um, building balanced concept starts from building balanced insight by identifying both implicit and explicit context, as I said that. Um, so yin and yang is really not about right or wrong. It's really about finding out that reaction. Every action has reactions. You know, every face has the opposite side. So in order for you to have a balanced design, you have to look at both sides. So I'll give you a good example. Um, f you know, for example, the opposite of plus is minus. The opposite of black is white. Spring, fall, summer, winter. Concave, convex, in, out, out, in. Individual, communal simple, complex, and so on, right? So what I mean by this is when you go through a design process and when you and your concept is defined, put a list of words on how 
your concept is being defined and deliberately look at the opposite end of that design and see if you're actually satisfying somewhere in the middle. Okay? So um, I'm going to now define user-centric to more like a context, user context-centric, which means that it's what the users uh, would do under the given explicit and implicit con context and how to deliver that uh, message in an unbiased way. So let me give you seven examples of yin and yang observation. Now, this is uh, um, an example that I found very uh, fascinating. I went through a process of actually living in Korea two and a half, for two and a half years and I came back to the US. I saw so many differences, contextual differences between East and West. It was so fascinating. Let me share that with you to, to let you know what I mean, okay? <coughs> The first one is the, the, the address system. When I moved to Korea, they asked me to you know, do the alien registration, you know, ask me for my address in the US, what's my address in Korea, and I found something very interestingly different. In Korea, probably in Asia, but specifically in Korea, when you define an address system, it's almost like an absolute system. First, within Korea, there's the province. Within that province, there's a city. Within that city, there's a district. And inside that district, there's a location. And in that location, you exist. That's the concept. Remember, uh, take, a, take a good look at the word you. You exist. In the US, it's completely the opposite. I, Yoon Lee, it's not you. I live in this location, which happens to belong to this street which is within the city limit that belongs to the state. So you can see in one culture, same people, same human being, homo sapiens, all, all over the place, right? One is completely outside in, the, the other one is completely inside out. What do I see? In one culture, I see more absolute value. The other one is relative. I see more of a passenger mentality in one culture. Whereas the other culture, I see more of a driver mentality. I see more of a concave type of feeling. Whereas on the other culture, there's more of a convex type of feeling. This is my insight. So it, I'm not saying this is right or wrong. You don't have to agree to my insight. But this, these are some of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to, uh, to, to, to encounter. Another example, measurement system. Most metric system is an accumulative system. You know, how, how long is it? It is... 1.4 millimeters, right? That's very common in Asia. In traditional UA, you never say 1.4 inches. You say one and what? Three eighths of an inch. So you have a whole inch, then you divide that into half, then you divide that into half, which is a quarter, then you, you divide that quarter into a half, which is an eighth, and so on. Again, completely backward system, right? So in one end, it's kind of glass is half empty kind of culture. The other end is glass half full. Accumulation type feel on one culture. The other one is more like contribution or, 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 or giving away. The other one is like more forward. The other one is kind of more reverse. Another example. On the left, this is what you would see in a typical Korean restaurant. And that's, that's actually for four people, but sometimes that's just for two people. You know, can you count the dishes? They got so many dishes that it's actually piling on top of another dish. On the right, this is a typical meal, you know, that we would eat here in America, right? What does that tell me, right? It's a more communal way of thinking in one culture versus more individual. It's a more complex way of thinking in one culture versus more simple in the other culture. One culture, I need to cover everything, right? On the other culture, it's more like focus. So for example, when I write reports in Korea, if I write a very simplified executive deck in four, four pages, I'm in trouble. I may do that, but at the back end, I have to put probably 200 pages of appendix trying to cover what I've discovered. In America, it's the other way around. You know, if I don't get to the point, they don't like me, right? Now, a, a, a simple example is, this is a search page between 
the number one search website, Google, versus the number one uh, website in Naver. You can obviously tell the market share. It's 6.3% in Korea versus 75.4% in America, uh, in, uh, for, for the neighbor. So if you understand this, I think Google can change their strategy a little bit if they want to be successful in Korea again. If they don't want to be successful in Korea, which is a biased market, they don't have to do that. Another one is a traffic system. In Korea, in most places, you cannot make U-turns or left turns unless it's posted that you can. Whereas in America, in general, you can, you can take U-turns or, or, or left turns unless it says explicitly no U-turn, right? So I see one culture more like you're guilty, prove yourself innocent, versus you're innocent until proven guilty kind of, kind of thinking. It's a more permission-based culture in one end. It's a more exception-based culture on the other end. It's a top-down culture. The other one is more bottoms-up. This is a wild example, and I, I really like this example. Th th these are like stock ticker, like the stock electronic boards at uh, stock trading centers. In Korea, when the price starts uh, going up, it turns red. In the US, when the price starts going down, it turns red. What does that mean? In Korea, it means like, hey, it's falling, which turns green. Go buy that stock, is what they're trying to tell you. In the US, it's saying, hey, it's falling. Go sell that damn stuff before you're in, in trouble, right? They want more attention for buying. And the other culture is more warning. I kind of see like the later mentality, like you, you know, instead of like selling and getting your money, like accumulate your stock, you know, maybe you can sell it later. You know, I kind of see that in one hand. On the other hand, it's more like now culture. I need to make money now. If I lose my money now, I can't really deal with that. So if it goes down, I'm gonna sell it. Another one. This, was a, this, this, uh, this is a, a photo of my bathroom. N not anymore, but when I used to live in Korea, the one on the left is, actually it's backwards. The one on the right is the one in Korea. The one on the left is the one in the US. What are the differences? Can you see the light switch? In one bathroom, light switch is outside of the bathroom. The other one is inside the bathroom. So like when in Korea, my daughter used to play pranks on me, like when I'm in the bathroom, she just turns off the light. I have no control over that. You know, all I can do is just yell, right? So what I can see from this example is in one culture, it's more like served culture, like let the light be on, and then I walk in, right? Whereas on the other culture, I walk in, I don't have to turn the light on if I don't want to. It's up to me. It's more a DIY culture, right? It's an output culture on the, on the one hand. What's the output? It's, the, it's, it's, it's a bathroom with lights on. The other one is more input culture. Um, I think Korea is more focused on the space. And I think the US is more focused on the user. So I mean, I went through all, like six examples. You can, you can already see so much difference between those two examples. And imagine designing something in those two biased societies. It's, 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 it's hard. And within those own societies, it's got even its, you know, their own bias as well. Let me show you one last example before I proceed on with, uh, with my next argument. It's a parking lot situation. And this, this is kind of bizarre to me as well. I don't know why Koreans park backwards, even if the space is that wide. Every time I go to Korea, they don't park forward. They always park backwards, reverse in. Whereas in the US, in general, you just put your nose right in, right? Again, I see it's more like out culture in Korea. They, they, they want to exit in a more convenient way. So they're kind of saving for later. Whereas in, in the US, I want to go in 
and I gotta, I gotta take care of my business right now kind of culture, right? So, so that's the difference that I see, right? So with those differences, I'm gonna show you three examples, maybe time, time permitting, maybe just two, how to design something that fits within the context. The first example is this candy called icebreakers. Do you guys know this candy? It tastes good, right? I love it. It's made in the USA, good old USA. What's really funny is that if you look at that label, in one side it says to share, and the other side it says like not to share. Now the, the context of this being created is a con and, you know, and obviously there's one opening that's big, wider, and then the other opening that's kind of smaller. This is the kind of context, you know, like when you share your mint with someone, you kind of do that in, in, in the US, right? So, this is sold in Korea though. Like, I, I, I saw this in Korea, right? Which side is to share and which side is not to share? Again, in this kind of culture, right? You kind of guessed it, right? It's a smaller opening is for share because you want to kind of tap, tap, tap to your friend's hands. You don't want your friend's hand kind of reaching into my food, right? So not to share is the bigger opening, but you're actually selling it to a country that does this, you know? This is how, how people eat food in Korea. They dig into one same pot, multiple spoons that goes into your mouth, someone else's mouth, they all share saliva together. It's gonna happen if you live in Korea, right? This is not contextually right. People get confused. When I show this example um, in Bangkok, 90% of the people voted that the larger opening is to share and the smaller opening is not to share. There were four people that didn't vote and they were all from America. <laughs> so in Korea, if I were the manufacturer, I would simply do this. Just take the label out, rotate it, and then put it back on, right? That's contextually right for that culture. Second example is about the elevator. Is the sound coming out through the PA system? No? Okay, all right. So. This is a hotel room that I stay in Korea. I probably stay, I stayed more than 100 nights there, right? There's an elevator, and they renovated recently, and it looks really nice inside. Um, when you try to access one of those floors, this is what happens. It says, sorry, the floor selected is a restricted floor. So when I hit that, I mean, for like, I, I just couldn't figure out what that meant. You, you, hit, you hit like floor six and says like, sorry, the floor you selected is a restricted floor. And I go like, what? <laughs> what am I supposed to do, right? Here's the real context, right? It's a Korean hotel, but more than you know, 75, half or 75% of the clientele is a business traveler and they're non-Koreans. There are only small numbers, number of Koreans. Um, probably the designer was Korean and sh the designer was actually not aware of the fact that it's, it's more of an exception culture, right, in, 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 in West, but not in Korea. So, sorry, the floor you've selected is a restricted floor, may make sense to Koreans, but it doesn't make sense to Americans or foreigners, right? So instead, it should have said, please swipe your card to access this floor, right? The announcement should be the other way around. That's a very simple design, but the design is completely screwed up um, catering to the kind of people that they're trying to cater. Um, the last one is about organization design, but I don't think I have time to go through this. I think the pinnacle of design is really an organization design. And if, I don't know, maybe if I can just fast forward like in five minutes. <coughs> if you're trying to launch something from concept to end of life, uh, from time to market, it's a linear process. Like the best way to handle your concept, retaining your concept, your value proposition to the market, is you doing it all by yourself. Because it's a linear process. It's an analog process. The way you launch product is not a digital process. But as your organization gets large, you start create, you know, you, 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 you can't help but creating all these different departments, you know, from strategy to design, develop, marketing, all the way to customer support, right? What you see is those departments are siloed and digital, not analog. It's trying to support an analog process using a digital organization. So what you see is all these gaps that just doesn't close, right? 
And worse yet, what happens is that you point all these friction points between silos, the, the communication barrier starts existing. What happens when the product gets more complex and you scale up your business, that's the context, you're kind of going something like that, right? The implicit context is the more silos you create, the harder it gets to communicate. This is what's actually happening in, uh, in real life. Strategy now becomes strategy and strategy and planning department becomes strategy and planning. Design department becomes now a hardware design and a software design. And within software design, there's UX design, front end design, cloud design. Hardware development, everything just kind of goes biz you know, bizarre. And you can, you can see like even, even no matter how small of an organization that you create, it's still a digital process and you create all these gaps. And worth said, you got more friction points to communicate across. So time to market, it gets even later. And what you create at the front comes out as a completely different dinosaur at the end. How do you cope with this problem? There's no single bullet, silver bullet, or one solution to this. It's very difficult. One way to do is creating a rotational program. So a strategist become a designer. A designer become an en uh, engineer or, or developer. A developer becomes a manufacturing person. That's the interdisciplinary way of making something analog with a digital organization. It only works in small number of segments and, a, and, a, and, a, and not so complex product. If it's like building a, building a rocket or, 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 you know, like a medical devices, there's special knowledge that's required for, for not th that being effective. But that's one way of doing it. Another way is a Toyota way of creating a head of product, a mini CEO, and putting all cross-functional team into one product. But something like that only works for a platform of products that you can manage, not something like Samsung where we launch 15,000 SKUs a year, right? So it's, a, it's very designed. So one more thought, just food for thought, generic. Borrowed, shared, disposable, instant. What does that kind of sound to you? What's the opposite to generic in your mind? Tailored? What about borrowed? Shared? Disposable? Like equity? Equity came to my mind. Instant? Planned, right? On the left side, what does that kind of remind you? That reminds me of the current shared economy model, right? And I see it as is now, it's successful because it's starting and there's no base, there's no statistics to draw a bell curve, but I can see it's completely skewed to the left. So, so I think the next wave should be something that you need to move in, into the middle to improve the shared uh, service model. So question something like this, you know, what if the cloud lets your driver download who you are? So instead of like searching for, did you call Uber? You know, you can actually find that person, open the door and say, hey, John, let's go. You know, something more personal. What if, if Airbnb sends a care package based on your personal preference to, to that site that you're visiting? You know, what if, uh, Uber and Airbnb has some sort of a loyalty mileage program for equities, right? What if, if I can plan my next Uber ride? Uber is like instant, right? But let's say Uber expands into an another model, and if I'm coming from an airport, I can plan that. It's a higher cost, so the Uber driver gets paid more, but you know, it comes to me exactly the way I want it. Someone who lives in my neighborhood, the, the driver lives in my neighborhood, the driver knows me, he drives the kind of car that I want to ride, and you know, things like that. So, food for thought, right? Always try to deliberately balance your one uh, buy. So good design usually comes in well-balanced points, pairs, right? So if you look at, you know, to get the good perspective, you need both eyes. Unfortunately, with one, one eye, you can't really get a good perspective. You know, you need both ears to, to have a good balance. I don't know who that is, by the way. You know, two legs to support. Why not use both brains? Why, as a designer, you, why do you tr always try to use right brain if you're a designer or left brain only if you're a business planner? Business, design, everything in life is not this or that. It's left and right. 
So a good design has the power of delivering unmet needs to the user. Meeting unmet needs creates delight, and that's, it's, it's, that's the first path of a very good design. And unmet needs are usually discovered outside of your own bias. And counterbalancing you know, your point of view by deliberately looking at the opposite side is very important. So a good habit that you do from this point on is when you're stuck in a design paradigm, list what that design paradigm stands for in words and try to find the opposite word and see if you're hitting anywhere in the middle. Okay? So that concludes my speech today. Thank you very much.